Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Vocast. I'm your host, Drew. We've got another special guest with us for session nine at this point. We have Miss Lolly Wren. Is that how you pronounce it? It is. Welcome to the Vocast. And how are you doing this fine day? I'm good. Doing very well. Thank good. You. Good. We're excited to have her with us today. She is best known for her YouTube presence as the Fairy Voice Mother. She is an experienced vocal coach and a very charismatic and enthusiast or enthusiastic music teacher, singer, etc. And we're excited to learn more about her today. So just give us a very brief like explanation of your musical involvement. Musical involvement um, started when I was seven, six or seven, I don't remember, when I started learning flute. So I fell in love with learning flute and performance in that realm. And I joined um, orchestras and played flute to a pretty decent level throughout all my childhood, teenage years and stuff like that. And was in orchestras, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I started singing when I was 11 and mimicking singers that I liked from albums that mm -hmm. were around. And then I just sort of fell in love with singing a tiny bit more than flute and ended up taking it to more places in terms of academia as well. So I yeah. uh, did a vocal performance degree. I'm currently doing a master's in voice pedagogy and um, just been, yeah, I've been singing professionally for as long as I can remember, really. It's sort of like I my earliest like memory as music i don't remember anything before i started either flute or singing so fair enough musical involvement would be my whole life it's the same <laughs> thing for me really you've got a lot of experience so far from what i've noticed how long is it how long have you been so since age of 11 i started singing okay yeah. and you were I'm, I'm not gonna ask how old you are but i'm just curious as to how long it's been since then <laughs> Well, those are those mathematicians out there can do the sum of I have been singing for fourteen years. Fourteen <laughs> years, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So <laughs> uh, we're going to start off with the traditional questions that we do here on the the vocast. Um, this was going to start off really light. What's your favorite or preferred drink? Tea. I'm English. <laughs> I kind of. I, I mean, I kind of wanted to be like she probably likes tea, but I wanted to ask anyway. <laughs> I'm afraid I am the most stereotypical English person you could ever meet in that realm. Yeah, <laughs> and tea is kind of a cop out because obviously there is no such thing as tea, you know, because matcha, black tea, chamomile, they're nowhere near the same thing. So by saying tea, I've covered a lot of bases. So I would always go tea, but I do enjoy wine as well. Oh yes. Um, what's your favorite tea? Again, an impossible question because it just totally depends on. My, I can tell you like my tea routine. So um, I will have a matcha every morning and then I'll sort of wind it down a little bit with something a little bit more fruity, maybe something, you know, and then it, yeah. every night I have a chamomile tea. So I suppose that's sort go. of tea. But then obviously black tea constantly throughout that as well. So Sweet. sorry, I'm waving a match around. I keep meaning to light this candle. <laughs> um, out the way. Hang on. <laughs> it's um it's a candle for your throat chakra if you're into that oh that's interesting i like to have it going whenever i do anything to do with singing or music Just, there you go there you go you sleep at night right i got you that's the that's the first tea i've got on the vocast so far that's interesting oh I have, we're eight episodes deep and I've gotten like two black coffees, a uh, whole milk. I've had, um, pineapple oh, juice. Yes. Are you familiar with Luke Taylor? No. <laughs> he's, uh, he's long story short. He's a TikToker, several million followers, been on American Idol. Um, I had him on a couple episodes ago and he said whole milk was his preferred drink. <laughs> sure enough. I know. Interesting. <laughs> Um, Bye. so this one's a little bit more, um, I don't know how to describe it, but, uh, it's a little more deep, I guess. What, or who got you into music? Oh, um, I'm afraid this is not a very deep answer. It would be when I think about this question, the answer is Barbie, because <laughs> I had the, I had the, um, 
opportunity to learn an instrument at school you know you get like a free music lesson or whatever and you could pick out a flute violin or piano yeah and um, my mum was like you're not having a piano because you haven't got the room you're not also not having a violin because you know everyone knows that beginner violin is um well <laughs> you know it's not, it's not the most desirable sound in the world and so she was like you know flute was sort of the only thing that's left and then I ended up playing this Barbie um video game and she had this flute <laughs> and it could like get the animals in the forest to come to her like would you play a certain melody and I was like well if Barbie does it then you know I'll give it a go so yeah it was just like, it was like there's no one musical in my family really uh, wasn't something that was encouraged particularly or you know I didn't I wasn't exposed to any kind of music growing up apart from whatever was on the radio my mum loves like 90s dance bangers you know yeah, so that's no interesting musical exposure <laughs> it was just something that I didn't know I wanted to do but once I started doing it it was like falling in love so yeah. it was it, it basically hit you like a ton of bricks like this is where I'm meant to be it yeah exactly yeah, it really it, was like that. It's interesting to know. I've, I've run into several people here in my YouTube journey where they music wasn't like their first choice and they just kind of discovered that it was meant for them. I thought that was interesting. Mm. You never would have thought, right? Well, I don't know. I can't really remember much before then anyway. I just know that it was my only option because it was the only thing I could do. It, you know, everything, <laughs> there was that as well. I'm not very good at anything else, really. School, <laughs> maths, I'm not very good. I'm just not very good at anything else. So it's just sort of like, if this doesn't work, I'm swear what I did. I don't know if it's there on this channel, so I'm not going to. Not but, them. No, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it had to work out, really. So I just, and that's why I put all my eggs in the music basket, and um, which is why I've probably done people sometimes surprised that I've done a lot of stuff considering my age and that, but it's just because I didn't have anything else. Yeah. You know, so. Well, at the end of the day, it worked out, right? It's working out I'm at least. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who are some of the most influential figures in your life as well as your career? Um, influential figures in my life. Well, definitely my granddad. My granddad was the most amazing person ever he was very focused very caring everything he did was for his family he always did everything with benevolence good intention he served his community he was a barber he used to work every day of the week going to people's houses cutting their hair and all that kind of thing and mm -hmm. he really taught me the value of hard work integrity family and yeah you know so he is definitely the most important figure in my life N nothing to, he didn't Im influence my career in terms of like directly mm -hmm. but in every other way he's the reason I'm I am anything really and, and he obviously he helped me because my family was not a rich family at all but mm -hmm. he worked so hard and he was the one that paid for my flute lessons and that kind of thing so yeah I would I, awesome. always say I would have absolutely nothing without him so yeah that's that's awesome huge hand in your life it sounds like oh yeah <laughs> what is something that um that any other influential figures or your grandfather in this case what would what would be something that one of these influential figures has said to you that stuck with you your entire life journey people that I don't know of things that I've read in books have stayed with me the most when I started to discover uh, spiritual the spiritual realm and learn teachings from people like you know like things that everyone's read like Eckhart Tolle and um, Wayne Dyer and people like that those mm -hmm. really deep sort of spiritual foundations to to, to the rest of everything so the when you when you read things like you can manifest your destiny for example is that one that it's kind of like a, a bit of a cliche now but reading mm -hmm. those the first time in those sort of self-help books really encouraged me actually to 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 not accept what your current situation is if it's not what you want 
so just really cliche things like that like you can do whatever you put your mind to and uh, <laughs> dream believe achieve like, i love all that i think it's i think it's lovely i i really take those things deep within and if i have a moment where i feel a bit anxious or whatever i repeat things like that to myself as a bit of a mantra just basic things that you can make them as profound as you want it depends on how you in, interpret them so that would be sort of how i conduct myself but my biggest musical influence in terms of something that people have said to me in lyrics is probably Jeff Buckley. And when I listen to the lyrics of his songs and just generally how he conveys messages, I feel yeah, like yeah. he's in me. You know, so. Yeah, definitely. I, I need to, I haven't listened to him that much, but I know that I need to listen to him more. He's got, he's got a heck of a voice. Yeah. Well, it won't take you long, unfortunately, because he only ended up doing one album before he sadly died. So just listen to the Grace album and um, you've done his discography. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, definitely got to check out more of his work. Yeah. Um, so do you play any instruments? Flute. <laughs> yeah, I remember you said that. Yeah. Yeah, flute and I play the clarinet. I can play keys. I mean, I'm all right. I, I can get by. I can sing and play keys and that. But um, yeah. I play f flute is pr probably the, the thing that I'm better at. Yeah. Well, how long have you been playing the clarinet? Uh, clarinet is something I just sort of started it when I was about uh, 10 because I was doing quite well with flute and the other thing, and I really loved my flute teacher. Her mm -hmm. name's Jenny. She's yeah. She's a massive figure in my life as well, actually. But, and so the other thing she taught was clarinet. So I thought I'll have a go at that as well, just so I can spend more time with her and more time with music and, yeah, so that was soon after flute, really. Sure enough. <laughs> yeah. So did you, I don't remember, did you say you played these throughout school as well? All these? Yeah, yeah, all throughout school. I, I had the lessons at home in the end. Okay. Um, but I, yeah, I played for school. I played um, every Saturday. I had uh, orchestra um, rehearsals and then I played orchestra recitals and stuff like that, so. Sure yeah, enough. I played with the London Symphony Orchestra and stuff like that throughout summer, and yeah, just whatever I could really. That's awesome. How long have you been playing the piano or keys, as you call it? Well, I bought myself my first piano when I was twenty-one, and so I suppose again, if you want to work out how hard I am, I'll give you a math equation. That was four years ago. Um, that so I suppose since then I could play it as well because you had to do keys at um when I was doing my vocal performance degree there was a keys module but I was never very good because I didn't have one so um I just practiced when I was there so I wouldn't I wouldn't count that really mm -hmm. but um, yeah and because obviously I can read music because I learned bass clef with clarinet and then treble clef with flute I just sort of bought a few grade books for piano and just read them and figured it out really so there ooh. you go there <laughs> yeah. you go and just just enough to be dangerous, right? Dangerous? <laughs> I won't go that far. I don't think my piano playing is a threat to anyone particularly, but... <laughs> <laughs> so um, what are some things that people might not know about you, like especially with like your internet and music life? What they wouldn't know about my music life? Or were they... Like just you in general that they might not see in your internet life? Oh, right. I don't think people would think that I suffer with um, mental health problems. I don't talk about it that much, but um, yeah, I have really suffer quite badly with depression and anxiety. It's something that I've always had. I've never been able to get rid of it. Because um, yeah. I think it's usually the people that are very emotive and um, caring, you know, because I, I, I deeply care about the the channel and things that I make and I, I always want to make sure people are feeling good and connecting mm -hmm. with people and I'm always very over the top and that and I think it's because it's as much as it seems sometimes to entertain and please other people it actually helps me as well because yeah I don't if I don't try and, and make that effort to be excitable and and full and vivid I the, the opposite would probably creep in so fair enough yeah, yeah. and that seems mm -hmm. like an out I know I used to have it back in the day well 
back in the day. I'm not even that old. Um, but I n remember whenever I struggled with it a little bit uh, f within the past few years, and I know that my out was just doing for other people, and it just it seemed to help a lot. Yeah, it does. It, it does, because you're serving other people, and that gives you a sense of um, you know, accomplishment and purpose, and that's what drives me, really. Yeah, for sure. And it and at the end of the day, it helps push it to the back burner. I've noticed it's like yeah. it, it's it's less. Uh, what's the word? It's it's presence is less. Uh, it's not there as often, I guess. Yeah. 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 You get what I'm saying. It's, I it's think. and it's a lot like uh, Robin Williams said, everyone's fighting a battle that you know nothing about and be kind. Always. That's, That's a nice. good saying. And I'll always live by that. Yeah. Good. Are there any other things that some people might not know about you that you were willing to share? I'm very bendy. Bendy. Very flexible individual. <laughs> I've always been able to do the splits. I can do all kinds of weird bendy stuff. I could put my leg behind my head and all that. Seriously. I that's I've always been fascinated by people that can do that. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. I don't. I've never really practiced it. I'm just naturally bendy. I think I've got <laughs> um, things I can do that and stuff you know my my joints just they just give just, <laughs> so. know, i've always thought that was interesting i don't know how they do it but it's cool just yeah i'm in the hands of god i don't know and <laughs> um, i used to be a dance teacher if people don't know that either oh that's Probably. cool yeah how long did you do that um well i dance i started dancing when I was three and studied all the way until I was about 16, like ballet and all that. And I used to teach dance from when I was 16 to when I was 20. Sure enough. Sure enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fun little tidbit. Oh, <laughs> what are some things that you do in your off time when you're not singing, recording for the channel, et cetera? Um, I forage mushrooms. Really? I love mushrooms. Yep. Yeah. I'll be in the woods for hours looking for mushrooms. Just, I love them. I just, I just love them. So, um, yeah, I love a bit of, um, bit of fungus and what, oh, well, with my dog, I love my dog. My dog is my baby. We go out every day for walks and I love just looking at her really. And, um, writing. I do a lot of writing. Sure enough. I do um, a free write every day. I don't know if you're familiar with that concept of free writing. Uh, I think I've heard of it before, but I've not really like delved into it. Well, all it is is you just um, set a timer for two minutes and then five minutes, and you must not stop writing the whole time. So even if you've got nothing to say, you just write anything, even if you have to end up writing the – Oh, it's a bit cold in here. I haven't got any ideas. And then you just, your subconscious will just kick in and you will sometimes come up with something quite profound. It's a really good way to figure out how you really feel. Because sometimes I thought, oh, I've had a marvelous day and loads of lessons. I was in a great mood. And then my free write will come out with something like, I'm exhausted. I have nothing left to give. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, crikey. I didn't know that was in there. So yeah, I love writing. Um, <laughs> songs i um i'm a professional vocal arranger so people give me a song and i write all the harmony parts for it and sing them so i do that that's cool i didn't know that yeah <laughs> yeah mike could use your assistance in some uh, vocal projects i have in the future then oh yeah I'd love i love it yeah anything anything all genres everything i love the challenge it Sweet, sweet. Got myself a contact for some arranging folks. You do. You do. That, that is awesome. <laughs> so how often do you practice singing throughout the week and how long do you typically practice for? That's a good question. I have focused practice sessions for myself, usually three times a week. I do them mm -hmm. on my teaching days, which is probably not a good idea because I'm a bit tired, but <laughs> I'm in singing mindset and pedagogy mindset mm -hmm. um, and I'll have themes for each practice so most of my practices at the moment are uh, extreme vocal techniques mm -hmm. so I'll practice growling sc screaming like fry screaming um distorted belts I will warm up obviously all the time just to keep my voice nice and stretchy and mm -hmm. I will just try a different drills and see what I can do in context of a song and yeah 
<laughs> like 20 to 30 minutes each practice session because I'm I'm not focused enough to do anything longer than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Let's see. There's another. So you said about three times a week, about 20 to 30. So yeah. what does your uh, warm up routine look like on any given day? I always start with creaky hums. So I do like, mm, mm, just to see how my vocal folds are closing. So if I've got any mucus or inflammation or whatever, I'll be able to tell because the fry would be much thicker mm. and the, uh, the transition into phonation would be more effortful. Okay. So that helps me sort of assess situation in here yeah. and then after that i'll um stretch everything out i'll just do i just love lip trails really you know i just slide around on a lip trail and then after that it will be completely different depending on what i want to do yeah fair enough do you have a any one go-to warm-up exercise that you prefer over the others wow it's so i hesitate to say really because it's so personal um warm-up exercises that I wouldn't want to I don't like to recommend one thing but what I will say is just glissando in any sound in any semi-occluded vocal <clears throat> track sound which is just basically um a fancy way of saying put an object in front of your vocal phones whether it be your lips and your teeth or or a straw or your thumb just any sound that feels good any one of those silly sounds and just yeah. slide around across um your brain, you know, the, oh, oh, just that is my go-to, like, what's the size? Those glissandos and sirens seem to be a common trend I've noticed. A lot of people use those in their warm-ups. Yeah, you got to, because uh, you've always got to keep in, in touch with all the different modes that your vocal folds like to behave in, right? So if you yeah. just warm up something that's in your speechy range, you're, oh, you're going to have hard, a hard time if when you sing a song, it's got to go up oh, there, you know. Yeah. You should always warm up the higher end of your voice, even if you only want to sing low as well, because it's nice for the vocal folds, as I say, to have a nice stretch. So mm -hmm. it, it will alleviate tension as well. If you're someone that gets quite tight when they sing, you need to go up there just to, you know, shake it all about. Yeah, it's good for you. Trust me, I, I I could use all this all this advice. That's part of the reason why I have it on my traditional questions because I'm like, part of me wants to know for myself, but I know a lot of other people like to know as well. So I'm just like, I'm writing this down. <laughs> Good, yeah. <laughs> the information is out there. In yes. Different forms. Yes. Um, yeah. Stretch your voice. Let's see. What was the next question? I always lose track. I have so many questions on this list. I just lose track of where I'm at sometimes. That's all right. <laughs> so what are some of your record high and record low full chest notes? Oh, all right. Okay. Um, I thought you were going to say life events. So I was like, blimey. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I've got a few to choose and I'm taking. Um, so full voice, probably um, a B flat. What is this? Two. That's a B flat too, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's probably the the lowest note I could do. I mean, I can do notes lower than that, but it's very compressed, like the, this kind of quality, which doesn't really sound that good, so I don't mm, use it. Yeah. Um, record high notes in terms of so does like belting. Yeah, but, yeah, belt anything that's anything within your chest register. Um, an F sharp is the highest note of belt. What is this for? I always forget the numbers. Is that four? Five. <laughs> five. Oh, yeah, five. That's the highest note I can belt, but I don't because it's a risky one. I can belt most days on an F, so, yeah. That's awesome. So you're, so you're, what's your classification then in that case? Would that, would that put you like alto range? Yeah, I call myself a sort of contralto, really, because um, I do have a sort of tenor range in terms of what I can hit, but it, my voice doesn't sound that good. It sounds better in the contralto zone. I don't use the uh, FARC classifications um, usually, but if I were, that's the yeah. Point. See, and, I, and I'm not that well versed in like female classifications. I know that I'm pretty pretty versed in like male classifications but i'm still getting the ropes of what they what the classifications are for the females that's for sure 
Yeah, it's funny. The um, the the more I teach in that, the more I realise that the um, the male and the female classifications can be quite confusing. I don't because, for example, it's like, oh, if you're a, if you're a female, you, you know, you're not really a tenor. But I have t taught women that can sing like lower than some men that I can teach. So mm -hmm. it's really just um, I don't like to sort of put too many labels on it. I, I like to think of everyone having an attractor state of about an octave, meaning the notes that they speak with where your voice is most relaxed. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I just, whenever I start working with a singer, I just say, well, let's see if we can stretch it out both ways, get a little bit lower, get a little bit higher. Yeah. And you can call it whatever you want, really. But the the classification is just where where do you speak? And you can find that if you just sort of do an enthusiastic hey. So if you go, hey, the notes that you hit in there are your, is your range, is your classification. And you can have a little look on a chart and label it what you want. That's a really good way to find out someone's tessitura very quickly. Yeah. That's very cool. I'll have to try to get some people to do that someday and, and I've just kind of listened. And I could just kind of Oh, that's, that's interesting. You could figure out what their classification is just by hearing a really strong hey. Yeah, just the, don't. Yeah, you don't. The, the key is you've got to say enthusiastic because if you say just give me a really high or a really low, or whatever, people are like, okay, here we go. And then it's all tense and it's like, but if you just think enthusiasm, it comes out more naturally. And then you can, if your ears are not particularly ready to take in those notes and you can't pick them out, the better thing to do is just to do a voice note of it. And then you can play it back a few times and you can just pick out, hey, 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 hey I was there kind of. Yeah. No. Yes. That's pretty cool. I have to take that down. <sighs> let's see. What, so, um, let's see. So, what are some of, who are some of your favorite personal or personal favorite artists that you might I mean so have you ever collaborated with anybody in the past on, on any music? Uh, producers, yeah, but not artist wise. Oh, okay. And obviously, because I work um, as a vocal arranger yeah. for right. other people's songs, so I suppose if you count that, then yes. But in terms of a joint venture artistically, no. But I have some. Plans. Oh, yes. Awesome. That's awesome. I, that answers a question that I have later for you. But oh. um, <laughs> so um, so who are some of these people that you've collaborated with on um, vocal arranging projects? Who are some um, of your personal favorites? Well, I can't really say because a lot of them aren't out yet. So I can't talk about the ones that aren't out. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> you, yeah, it's uh, I hesitate to say at the moment just because my best work hasn't been released yet fair enough fair <laughs> um, enough so sort of in the last couple of years some of the stuff that that i'm most proud of um but due to several things like artists wanting to make music videos and mixing and whatever these projects are taking some time mm -hmm. so i'll i'll keep you posted on on that one <laughs> awesome can't wait to hear it oh, thanks. <laughs> so um who would you like to collaborate with in the future? If it could be any musician, any arranger, who? They have to be alive though, right? <laughs> well, well, we'll do the alive portion first. And then if you could collaborate with any passed on, then do that as well. Okay. If any seance collaborations. <laughs> um, no, I think more, uh, I love Jacob Collier. I'd love to do something with him. That'd be fantastic. Um, and I love, Salvador Sobral, he's a Portuguese singer. He's one of my favorite singers. Um, I love oh, all different kinds of things. I love, uh, do you know Stromae? Stromae? I've heard the name, but I've not heard the music. Oh, I bloody love him. So it's definitely him. Yeah, those three would be my... That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so as you called it, um, who would you like to have a seance collaboration with? <laughs> um, oh, what I wouldn't give to have a seance collaboration with Jeff Buckley isn't. Yeah, I just, yeah, he's I, my favorite. I kind of saw that one coming. Meant so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> yeah, definitely him. And then obviously all the normal ones like Whitney Houston and stuff like that. <laughs> Elvis is probably the mine. Oh, Elvis would definitely be mine. 
Yeah. He's just he's he's got a very similar voice to mine, at least in the where the voice naturally sits, I guess. And I just I would love to do a duet with him if I ever had the chance to. Oh, yeah, because I suppose then your voices would blend really well, wouldn't they, for harmonies and stuff? Be... I, I'd like to think so, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you still can. If you can find um, an a cappella version, because you can, there's um, there's a website called a cappella for you or something, and um, you can just type in the artist and see if they've got, because some people are able to extract the lead vocal from the rest of the audio really well, and some people also manage to find leaked files from the original recording, which is probably a bit naughty, but if you mm. can find an a cappella of his, chuck your voice on top of it. That's you cool. True. That is so cool. I might have to like play with that in my off time. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so um, do you have any tips, tricks, or life hacks for anyone that sings, wants to sing, or is trying to make a career out of singing? Tips, tricks, and life hacks. All right. Well, um, anyone... So those three different positions, right? Someone who doesn't sing at all, but wants to. Mm -hmm. First one, the tip I would have for them is to listen to singers that you like and make actual notes, like in a notebook of why you like their voice so much. Because a lot of the time we have this unfortunate sensation of like idolatry that a lot of people we listen to people that we love so much and we're like oh there's no way i could ever do that no way no way they're so good why are they so good if you know why they're so good at least you have tangible things to work on right so if you want to get into it make notes about why you like them so much because it might actually be easier than you think obviously there's things like oh because they're so emotional whatever but you will be an emotional singer if you sing about something you care about even if you don't have the rudiments like you know you haven't trained and your pitch is a bit rubbish and you're not resonating it very well and you can't do riffs whatever. we can teach you all of that but right. the, so you just need to know what it is you want to learn and then someone what was the second thing someone that wants to sing better or? yeah so um so for anyone that sings wants to sing or is trying to make a career out of singing okay so if you sing already so i suppose if you sing already and you want to make a career out of it I think there's so many, this is the best time to be alive, right? If you want to make a career out of singing, then you should be very lucky that you're born now because you don't need all the things that you, you used to need. Like if you wanted to record an album 30 years ago, you need like a hundred grand on a major label, right? Because you couldn't, mm -hmm. you had to go to a studio and you needed loads and loads of money. You don't need that now. To, to make an album, you just need a, like a tablet and garage band and a like a, <laughs> little tiny i don't know what this is it's a tiny microphone the tiny yeah. cheap microphone. airpod microphones or something even yeah 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 i mean that's a good way to start right so mm -hmm. there's no excuses if in terms of wanting to record music and there's no humongous costs involved so right. if you want to make a career out of it you need to practice because there's it's unlikely that the first few songs you're going to make are going to be fantastic so mm -hmm. make a lot of songs Find people who are in a similar boat to you on the internet, someone with a similar amount of um, clout to you and, and team together and have this safety in numbers and support each other. Sing yeah. on each other's songs, do all of that stuff. Go on Twitch and sing live, do live streams and um, see if anyone comes and get really confident like by singing all the time and making just make lots and lots and lots and don't expect anything for a while, but just... You have to make sure that you're singing because you want to, not because you think you're going to be a superstar. Yeah. Because people can see right through that. And if they, if your intentions are good and musical and you're making music that you really care about because you want to, you will, people will resonate with you. Even if you're not the most technical singer in the world and even if your lyrics are not like, the most amazing thing in the world it's all about how you make someone feel so yeah you just got to practice you can't um as we would say where i'm from you can't flog a dead horse i mean you can't sell something that's not very good so you need to practice and stay consistent right well yeah that's it that's it you just make lots of things and one day you might look at something you've made and think that's actually quite good. And you might sort of try a little bit harder to promote that one and send this one out to, to what all the things you can do now, like get featured on a playlist and all of that stuff. 
Yeah. But you'll know. You'll know when you've got something really special. But um, that comes with time. I heard Sia once say that her sort of strategy strategy for songwriting is to like throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. Like just write something every day, and a lot of them won't see the light. <coughs> Some, the ones that do, obviously, in her case, <laughs> did very yeah. well. So. Right. And plus the amount of spaghetti you throw at the vault, is some of it's going to stick. That's it. Something will be good. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I got a few more for you, then we'll jump into your self-promo. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts on extended techniques in singing? Extended techniques? Being like subharmonics, um, ingressive phonation, false folds, etc. Yeah, I mean, I'm dedicating a lot of my life to that because it's um, what I'm basing my master's degree off of. So, um, yeah. yeah. So my thoughts on those is that it's an extremely exciting realm that hasn't been trodden into very much. Yeah. And I am very excited for the research and science that's that will come and so much so that I want to be a part of that. Um, scientific contribution so yeah I think it's a wonderful thing because these techniques have been around for hundreds of years anyway in other parts of the world and it's time I think now for them to start to be introduced to the music that we all know about so yeah definitely and it's crazy how how much untapped potential there was until people started discovering it yeah that's it that's it. I think vocal techniques historically, well, obviously, because the history of vocal technique and pedagogy is very short in terms of what, what we know. And the more we learn, the more, like, the more stuff people tried, right? For example, we mm -hmm. didn't have the kind of pop belt sounds that we have now, even sort of 60, 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. we, the only kind of vocal pedagogy that was out there was like the bel canto, the classical opera that was that was it that was how you sing and everything else is rogue but now obviously it's not we've got all different kinds of voice pedagogy to learn and and in in other realms of contemporary singing you know like belting and all that mm -hmm. huge progress has happened and um, now there are, are new things like i think it's um cvt complete vocal technique that are doing a lot of um scientific research about extended uh, you know, harsh vocal techniques and loads of sort of, loads of things going on so yeah i'm excited so um do you use any like or do you i know you mentioned you do like false fold uh, screams and such do, yeah. what others do you do if any um yes yeah, so i do a growl a fry scream i do subharmonics and in terms of like so both the subharmonics that start from true folds but with the naturally occurring low note underneath and then also the subharmonics where you use uh false folds and true folds at the same time like kagura throat singing um i think that's it i love sub. i've come to really love subharmonics lately ever since i started learning how to do them yeah it's addictive isn't it oh my gosh it's crazy mm, it's so crazy go. Oh, you slipped into that very fast. It, it's it, it's not always like that. <laughs> it's not always like that. I think today's just a good day for my voice. Oh, good. Uh, That's... Yeah, it's, go. it's in and out. But I just only recently learned this back in November. Oh, nice. So it's pretty yeah. crazy. Oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. Um, it's funny. I think because as soon as I started learning, I was sort of addicted to it. And I'm just sitting all the time, you know, fries and stuff. And, you know, when cats purr, they do it because it heals them and others around them, that sort of really low level vibration. Mm -hmm. And I reckon that's something to do with us as well. I reckon creating those really low frequencies do something in our body that make us want to do it all the time. I think it's like purring. Mm, it's, I mean, it, it's awesome. What are your thoughts on ingressive phonation? Ingressive phonation, meaning like inhaling and doing the, uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> <Give it a> go. <laughs> Suck it in and see, I suppose. Yeah, I think if anything is irritating, don't do it. But if you can ingressively finite and turn things on and it's really basic and, and fabulous, then you should absolutely do it. Yeah, it's my I've, I've started asking everybody what they think of it ever since like the past few episodes, because it's my preferred extended technique. And I just love it. I use it in everything I sing. Oh, right. 
Right, nice. I mean, what's obviously really cool about it is it's a way to um, continuously make noise because you can use that as part of your inhale for a breath. So I suppose a lot of beatboxes and stuff like that. It's it's insane how low you can go with it. Yeah. My Fair my enough. thing was it's just incredibly difficult to control. It's well, yeah, because you've to control your vocal folds to oscillate consistently, which is what control and consistent pitch is like continuous oscillating of the folds you need to really control the intake of breath and obviously when we inhale it's quite um like this we don't generally breathe with a perfect flow of air so i suppose if that's something you want to develop just practice breathing in really slowly and consistently so sort of give yourself four counts to like and then exhale and then just finding that right balance, that good balance, right? Yeah. Yeah. And set it to time. So you've got a goal. I think just sort of the goal of like, let's hold it for as long as we can and, and stuff like that is quite stressful. And it probably makes the flow more inconsistent because you're like, come on, no, let's hold it together. And then you, you suck in loads more breath and then it falls apart. So yeah, yeah I'll set it to count. Definitely. We'll have to work on that and see how it does. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So this one it's kind of on the on, like on the fence but i want to ask it anyway do you have perfect pitch do i have perfect pitch no i have relative pitch okay. so from being in an orchestra for example everyone tunes on a right so i've mm -hmm. heard an a for hundreds and hundreds of hours in my life so i would have started working out things from there and also just because it's memory and then i know how my voice feels when I hit certain notes. So when I belt towards the top end, I'm like, yeah, that feels like an E based on the feeling. And then I can work things out relative from there. So a lot of times I can hear a note and guess what it is, but it's not a gift. It's just something that's happened as a result of memory. Yeah. Muscle memory, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Perfect. It's quite a rare condition. I have a couple of students with it and it's, and they hate it. Like for example, it bothers them all the time hearing, you know, like a dog bark or a siren, and be like, ah, it's an A, ah, like, you know. Yeah. It's, it's quite rare, but a lot of people can have relative pitch. I, under, I, understand the, I understand their pain. Oh, you have it, yeah. I've been told I do. You would know if you do. Like, you would just literally play a note and you know exactly what it is. You don't need to think about it. It's, yeah. You would definitely know if you had it. Do you, you can play any note, and I, I think, or I should be able to. Try oh, it. Oh, right. Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh, the piano's off. Mm, A flat. Yeah. D flat, C sharp. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That's very fast. Yeah, you probably do. <laughs> it's good to know that I've uh, got a little bit of confirmation there. Yeah. I mean, it's if it's instant, then you that's it. If you don't have to be like, Shh, sh, sh. you'll know if you're figuring it out from other notes or whatever, you just recognize that note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Good to know. Um, well, last one, and this one's a little deep. Uh, what is one of your things about, one of your favorite things about being a singer? Aw. Well, my favorite thing about being a singer is um, it's, I think of my voice as like, a little best friend because it's singing to me supports me through everything it supports supports me through sadness and i'll sing and and i can feel those vibrations and be in the sadness or it can make me feel even better if i feel good so my favorite thing about being a singer is being able to express myself all the time and it gives me a sense of companionship because it's something it's in me but it's bigger than me yeah it's it's truly amazing what the human voice can do, especially in the singing realm. Realm, I meant. I don't know what I just said there. Goodness. <laughs> it's tradition. Every single video I do, it's tradition for me to stumble on my words at some point. Yeah, I can obviously relate to that because I don't have any edits in my videos that are longer than like six seconds before I say something ridiculous. So <laughs> don't worry. The struggle <laughs> is real. <laughs> All right, so we have reached the midway portion. So now you've got your self-promotion piece where you get to advertise, share what you got going on with the channel, whatever you got going on with your life. You have the floor for the next few minutes. 
few minutes is probably too long really it's um it's quite it's all really in one place you know i've got the fairy voice mother youtube channel where i analyze like performances and break them down i include diagrams to help people understand what's going on about their favorite singers and i try and replicate them um this year i'm starting all new kinds of things i'm doing impression videos um that i'm also going to be breaking down that'll be um, cool yeah i'm excited to do that i've got it all planned i'm just waiting for a microphone to come that's sponsoring them so that will be there that'll soon be cool. <laughs> yeah and um analyzing musical films that's my new thing on the channel as well i already started with one and i'm gonna do it once a month um what else are we doing same old really just that's the newest thing there and then I'm working on an album that's going to be out this year for my other musical project songs that I've written. And that's another YouTube channel called Lolly Wren, which is my name. Um, and so, yeah, if you just subscribe to those two channels, you'll know everything that I'm doing, really. I haven't got anything else crazy going on at the minute. Everything else is two early stages for me to talk about now. <laughs> but there are other things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Guys, get excited for some of this stuff because she's very talented and we're excited to see more of her stuff. So, <laughs> um, so if you are done with your self-promotion piece, that will bring us to the next section where you have the floor to ask me any questions should you have any. So, <clears throat> What is your favorite animal? Mm -hmm. That's a, actually a really tough one. Um, There's a lot. You can have the top three if you want. I know it's hard. I know I, um, I'd i have to say if I had a favorite pet, it would probably be a dog. But that's funny considering I have a bird for a pet. Wow. I have. Insane. Oh, he's awesome. I love him to death. He's a pain, in the, he's a pain in the rear sometimes, but I love him to death. <laughs> I, I, I like to get – whenever I'm working my other job, I'll be sitting at home – doing my job and then he'll one out. So I'll go, I'll go get him. I'll set him on my shoulder and he'll just be sitting there perched while I'm working. Oh, I'll, oh, have to send, adorable. I'll have to send you a picture of him at some point. He's ridiculously cool. Um, I'd love to see. So I'd have to say if I had to pick three, I'd pick uh, a dog, a bird and what's the third one. I'm just going to pick a random one. A penguin. I love that. That's a really nice selection because you've got land, sky, and sea there. Exactly. Penguins are awesome. I mean, penguins I just, are amazing. I mean, if you've ever been to a zoo and you see a penguin, it's awesome. You you can't not smile when you see a penguin. That's... Just, just, wa just walking with the waddle. It's just so much fun to watch. I love everything about penguins, actually, more I think about it. Like the baby ones and they go in between the legs of the... Oh, it's too much. Yes, those emperor penguins and stuff. It's so cool. Yeah, penguins. Good one. Good one. Um, I ask these really random questions. I'm I'm, gen I'm not like just saying it because you're like, oh, would you want to ask me anything? Oh, I am genuinely interested. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the other question is, um, what is your favorite fabric? Fabric. What do you like to feel of most? I'd have to say velvet or um. There's another one, fleece. Oh, so good. Yeah. I love, I love like fleece blankets. Mm, yeah, those, those are awesome, and they're not particularly expensive either. So if no, they're not I, actually. Yeah. I I remember going to my my mom and my sister are both very creative. They they like to make um they like to make stuff like that. My mother quilts and my sister crochets. So. Oh. Lovely. So sh there, we went to a local store called Joanne's lately, and I remember like I've seen s fleece like at an all time low. It seems like like you can buy fleece fabric, fleece blankets are cheap, you know. And I remember I was just like, I love fleece blankets. That's lovely. And you can if if one ever craps out on you and and you can't use it anymore, you can always just go get another one for fairly cheap. Yeah, that's true. Fleece will always be there for you. Fleece is your friend. If I had to pick a least favorite, I'd probably have to say, like, Sherpa. What's, oh, is that like skin? It's almost like it's almost like wool in a way. 
Oh. I don't know Anything. how else to describe it, but is it itchy? It is after the first wash. Oh no! It yeah. definitely is after the first wash. That's not much good then, is it really? Not really, not really. But interestingly, velvet is quite divisive because some people despise velvet, like touching it makes them cringe, but then other people love it. So it's interesting that. It, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing. Like, I don't think I would sleep with it, but like. No, <laughs> I can imagine. No. Velvet sheets, baby. Yeah. <laughs> can you imagine inviting your significant other over and you go to like, go to sleep and then they have like velvet sheets. Yeah, I, I, I can't actually. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> it's so it's so weird. No, I think silk sheets are weird enough. I yes. like I, I like cotton. I'm quite vanilla with fabrics, really. Yeah, I'm I'm about the same. I like cotton. I like fleece, and I like uh, velvet. But I don't. I won't use velvet to sleep with. It's not, I'm glad that you made that distinction so now that we know any significant other of yours can rest assured they will <laughs> encounter no velvet marina i love you and that is not gonna happen so there you go <laughs> she, she knows she knows she knows Good. um <laughs> okay. anything else that sticks sticks out that you want to ask about yeah i would i would just like to know what kind of things you would like to do over the next sort of five years. I like a, I like to know people's five year plans. <laughs> so five year plan. So my goal currently, um, I actually didn't expect things to go as well as they have with the channel. I only started doing this back in November. Mm -hmm. So I would say like midway through November, I posted my first video. I took a lot of inspiration from people like you, Peter Barber, uh, Jennifer Glatzoffer, um, just a bunch of other reactors, but I wanted to do, I wanted to put a twist on it. So I wanted to do, I wanted to talk to singers, vocal coaches, learn more about them in addition to helping people understand why they love music. But I wanted to like interview singers in addition to reactors and such, you know, and nice. I ended up getting to a point to where I didn't think I ever would, where I'm able to monetize my videos and people are wanting to support me now. And I'm like, that's crazy. Aww, but that's... as far as the five years go, being that I didn't expect it to get this far, I'm going to be ambitious. And I'm going to say within five years, I'd like to have some of the biggest names in the music industry on this show or no. the show. But I'd like to have people as big as like Charlie Puth and stuff on here. That Good. would be difficult to line up, but I would love to try. Well, that's it. Once you increase your value, you know. Yeah. And the. I've went from like 10 subscribers to almost 2,100 in over the span of not even three months. And it's crazy the support I've got. So, I mean, what I want to do is I want to use that support to put back in. So like the bigger I get, the more attention I can get from other people that are big in the music industry. Yeah. And I know a lot of people want to know about these singers and stuff and that's exactly my goal is to help them appreciate the music by getting in touch with these people and just talking about music for an hour or two. Yeah. And hear it from, from the source. Exactly. That's exactly why I do it. I, I just love hearing about the music from the person that sings it. Oh, it's just, brilliant. it's wonderful. I'd love to have, I can't definitively say exactly who I want on yet, but my goal is to have some of the biggest names into the end in the industry on here within the next five there you go. Very doable. Very doable. Channels can grow rather exponentially. Yes, Especially indeed. if you can keep it consistent and understand what your audience likes and what it doesn't like and, and learn all the time on the job. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I'm using this as learn ex learning experience too. My, also, my goal also is like talk with these singers, one, re reactions to, but I also occasionally put out my own music too and Good. like collaborations and such. And my goal as far as that goes to, is to have a few uh, pieces that I'm proud of within the next five. Lovely. I'll have mm -hmm. to send you the first one that I did not long ago off camera. It's It was something that I'm proud of, but. Oh. Good. Uh, anything else that comes to mind? I think that's good. It's nice. So from your five year plan and your favorite animals, I can. 
like a, I know I know a, a decent amount. <laughs> awesome. All right, so we've got a little bit more time here, so I'm going to jump into some of these community submitted questions. Um, we've these were gathered across uh, Discord, YouTube, and other sources as well. Okay. Um, this one comes from Bass Krispies. Um, two or two vocalists that have not collaborated that you desperately want to hear collaborate. Oh, two vocalists that I would like to hear collaborate. That haven't I yet. Would say, well, yeah, two people that I would like to collaborate with, I suppose, which would be Salvador Sobral and Jacob Collier. They would do something beautiful. Mm hmm. I have not heard both of them yet. I know I've heard the names, but I've not heard their music yet. Mm. That'll be interesting. Yeah. Uh, this one comes from me directly. Um, <laughs> okay. Do you plan to post more individual music? So, you, like I said, that was kind of the one you answered earlier. But so, do you plan to do more individual music in the future? Yes, I'm working on an album very actively, and it will be out this year. As well as um, I'm starting to come up with examples of my acapella arrangement work as well, like in the form of shorts. So I'm working on um, acapella arrangements, which can be of covers or just things that I make up. I'm writing a lot of lullabies at the moment that I want to release as shorts with some vocal layers and stuff. So yeah, yeah. lots of plans for that. That's awesome. Uh, this one comes from Lost Soul. Uh, what range in the human voice do you consider to be musically and emotionally usable? Ooh. I don't understand. I'll try and think. What range? What's like most, like the most usable, I guess you could say. Like So that would be the, uh, the attractor state of the singer. So what we were talking about earlier, if you find um, the notes that naturally fall out when you do like a hey, that range is going to be what you will probably be able to invoke the most emotion and truth in. Because when you sing notes that are easy for you, you don't have to worry about the things you need to worry about when they're at either end of your range. Like for example, if you're at the very top of your belt range, you have to make sure that you anchor in a lot of technique. Sometimes people can perceive that as emotional mm -hmm. because it's like, wow, look at all of this motion. But actually that's just probably because it's at the, the edge of what they're capable of. Um, mm -hmm. So it's this, but that is obviously different for, each person. I think it's really nice to have a song that doesn't really change much in terms of range. It's quite, it's in quite a middle place, but yeah. then all of a sudden you have a big moment. Songs that are constantly at the top of your range throughout the whole song or constantly at the bottom, there'll be some kind of jarring quality about it because you will be able to just hear the singer is trying so hard all the time and it won't have that same kind of balance and resonance. So yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, this one comes from Basie Banana. What's your favorite vocal technique? So be it any register, any extended technique, what's your favorite if any one sticks out? First thing that comes to my mind is overtone singing where you hold a, a, a root note and then you make the overtones with your mouth, like the that kind of stuff yeah. because it's so accessible. Anyone can do it. If you can hold one note, you can learn how to retract your tongue, open certain areas, and you actually end up with dividing the frequencies inside that note, kind of like making a rainbow, you know, with your voice if it was a light frequency. Yeah. I love it so much because it's very accessible. Um, you don't need to sing a whole song. You don't have to worry about anything. You just hold the note and you can test what your anatomy is capable of beyond the actual vocal folds themselves. You can learn the power of the tongue, the power of the lips and all of this stuff that is so important to make a sound. So, yeah. There you go. Good stuff. <laughs> Let's see. I've, you got time for, I just got two more for you and then we'll go wrap this it. up. Go um, what would you, cons this one comes from Bass Krispies again. Uh, what, <laughs> I love his name. Uh, what would you consider the most successful music or vocal uh, niche niche right now? The most successful vocal niche. Well, the nature of that question is quite difficult because I think 
it being a niche, it's difficult to know how do you measure success? Would it be the growth of it? Would it be how deeply people relate to it and engage with it? One thing I'm appreciating more and more rapidly every day is the beatbox community. Mm. They are just ever since I started doing analysis to beatbox videos, I've just, my mind has just been blown with these people that most people would never have heard of. But in this niche, they're so admired. And there's a big focus with the beatboxing community of teaching other people how to do everything. I love it because I heard um, a beatboxer say that one of the greatest things about beatboxing is that any kid, no matter where they come from, can play all the instruments they ever want basically in their mouth because they do do that beatboxes they can it proves that you can just do anything you can make you can just sing a whole song all the parts with your mouth if you just practice and make weird faces isn't that um, crazy yeah <laughs> it is i'm um, so for that reason i consider that niche to be wildly successful and I'm, I appreciate it so much and I'm so excited to be a part of it more because they're all so supportive as well. I've not heard anyone judge anyone else. People seem to be really encouraging people that have never done it before to try it and to educate them and to show what they've learned. So it's wonderful, wonderful. Indeed. I have to I have to side with you on that one. Um, this one comes from Basie Banana. Um, someone who hasn't sang before and wants to try uh, what is the best way to approach it? So I know you I know you preach a lot about everyone has a voice and everyone should try singing. So if you they haven't sung before, any tips you have for them to when they start trying? Yes, you need to have a bit of a plan and you need to know what you want. Why do you want to sing? Who do you admire? So have a write everything down, have a list of singers that you like, a list of music that you like. Also, it's important to separate what you enjoy listening to and what you enjoy singing, because that's sometimes different. For example, I love singing um, like Whitney Houston songs for fun, like I belt them out. But I don't usually listen to Whitney Houston. I usually listen to uh, rock, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know what feels best in your voice, first of all. And then... Again, what I said earlier to make a list of things that you really like about people's voice. And if you don't know, that's also fine. So, for example, if you like five different singers, you could approach a vocal coach, for example, or someone that knows about singers and say, what do, why do I like all these singers? Do they have anything in common? Maybe they probably do, even if it's not immediately obvious. And then from there, you can make a plan about what to work on first. A lot of mistakes that um, beginners make is to not separate all the different things they want to learn. They want to just go from being a person that doesn't sing to a, the best singer or the best singer they can be. And there's all these vague goals, but they don't actually help. Yeah. So you need, if you can't assess it yourself in terms of what you need, you know, maybe you've got a problem with your pitch or mm -hmm. you are getting any vibrato or your range is very limited, all these things I hear all the time, then just have, have sessions with a teacher and you don't need to have vocal sessions for the rest of your life. That's absolutely not necessary. Mm -hmm. You just might need a few to get you going, just to teach you a little bit about your own voice and tell you what it is you need to work on. So, yeah, if you can book, if you can come really prepared to a vocal coach with all of this stuff, you will get a lot more out of your sessions and it will be better value. So, yeah. And if you think you can't sing, you probably can. You, you definitely can. Yeah. It's... I've never met anyone I couldn't help so there you go of course guys this has been a wonderful time with miss lolly here if you guys enjoyed the content make sure you drop a like throw some uh, comments down below let us know if you enjoyed it um make sure you throw a subscription my way as well if you're enjoying it guys make sure you check out her channel as well make sure you check out her individual work as it comes out I will drop all of her information in the description so that way you can um, learn more about her. Go check her videos out. She's phenomenal in every way. <laughs> Guys, we are wrapping this up today. This has been Drew on the Vocast. I love you. Take care of yourselves, and we will see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.